Hello there, and welcome to a film a day with me, Jordan Woodley. Again, I, <laughs> I can only say this so many times, but this is another seminal classic, um, you know, incredibly well received film that I have been wanting to see for a very long time. Um, and of course, it it's a further education within um, American black culture and their portrait and the portrayal in cinema with the 1992 um, social realist or crime, whatever you like to call it, a drama, Boys in the Hood. There is um, something to be said about how um, <laughs> some films you know, you, you hear about and you think, okay, I think I have a grasp on what this is going to be. You know, it, 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 this is a um, urban, you know, a representation of urban black life over the course of the 80s into the 90s. And you think, okay, I think I'm going to have a handle on, on what kind of story I'm going to be told. It's going to be, um, as I say, about uh, young boys growing up in the hood. There's going to be an element of um, sort of social realism and sort of the struggle, and there's also going to be elements of um, a little bit of, sort of like I say, there's a crime aspect to it, but it's more sort of intertwined with everyday life. But knowing that going in, you still don't get the sense of okay, this is. I, I understand why even nearly thirty years later, a film like this is incredibly, um, I don't know if groundbreaking is the right, the right word, but you can see how a conversation like this, a film representation, is worthy of its place, you know, of its place, and still has cultural relevance even now. Because Boys in the Hood is not, it, it, it's more, see I don't want to say documentary, but the way that it presents life is so slice of life that you almost feel like you're not watching characters. You are just simply watching the lives of these boys. And there are some shocking and, and, and you know, um, haunting ideas amongst it. But the way that it's represented through everyday life is, like I say, there's something almost like documentary about it, almost factual, the way that it's just, you know, there is, as I said with uh, yesterday's pick, um, sorry to bother you, there's something almost voyeuristic about the way the camera just observes the lives of these kids. So the film um, starts in the 80s, where you follow this, uh, I think he's 11, if, if, I, if I remember rightly, your old kid and his two friends, and they're just living life, there's nothing particularly... Um, unique about it it's just a couple of boys uh, everyday sort of events but of course amongst that because of the circumstances in which they live they are there are shocking things so of course the film opens with them coming across a crime scene where they see blood they see things that young boys aren't supposed to be seeing but after that the the film represents the idea that you know these boys are just kids and the way that they talk to each other is so naturalistic very much like how um uh, well films like eighth grade or good boys sort of tries to just create this sense of authenticity and it does so well in representing conversations that kids who both want to seem mature and yet in that also sort of show their immaturity and you get the kind of people they're gonna be based on the way that they're all, their conversations already are playing out. You know, the kind of personalities they have, you know, the speech patterns, even though, of course, when when we have the time jump, they're, of course, played by different actors, but th there's a brilliant para, you know, synergy between the younger versions of these characters as they, and until they get older. Um, and like I say, you just get this sense, of, like our, our lead boy, I suppose, even though I think all three of them are really, um, you know, it's more ensemble, but you get that sense of um, our lead who is, who 
he's ultimately a good kid. He has a bit of a temper on him. And of course, um, there is this sort of institutional racism thing going on where, you know, yes, he and another boy get into a scrap, but the way the teacher reacts to him and reacts to his mother are almost expecting an underclass, are expecting some impoverished background, even though, of course, we find out that his mother is currently studying her master's and, and you know, that that the issues are more to do with the circumstances in which they live rather than who they are as people. And then, of course, we then he then is sent to live with his father, furious. And he's such a good character. He's such a good representation of a man who... You know, he seems strict, he seems hard, and yet at the same time he is stalwart. He is desperately trying to be a good representation of a man. And again, this film is all about, um, I suppose, gender, sexuality, identity. You know, you, you, you get that sense of a ma- you know, a, a, a masculinity. So you get a man who is, you know, for all intents and purposes, trying to be a really good father, even though... You know, he's separated from the woman who, who, who you know, he shares his son with. You, um, you know, he isn't... It's sort of trying to break that sort of perpetual idea that all, oh, you know, black fathers abandon their sons. It's trying to say, no, this man is a good man and is trying really hard to, to set a good example for a son who is, unfortunately, in an environment where a community, where... It's very easy to slip through the gaps because syst- uh, systematically, you know, the police are bullying and dangerous. Even though you, you get this incredibly good scene between Furious and this police officer, even though the police officer is also black, he almost represents this internalised racism, the idea that now that he has the badge, he, he, he hates the black community. And there's a certain aggression within this police officer and standoffishness that you see, even though he only has two scenes. And yeah, and, and you just get this sense of, you know, unfortunately, because of the sort of impoverished circumstances, drugs are prevalent, crime is prevalent, you know, street gangs uh, are prevalent. And you just, you know, and it's not the fault of the individuals, it is the fault of the system. And the great tragedy in that and so, of course, then you uh, have this, this seven-year time jump. And I'm almost, I was almost saddened by that because I actually really liked following these kids as kids as they just encounter difficult and, and shocking things or everyday um, injustices. And yet, you know, and so you jump to the, to the, to the quote, of a present day where we have, you know, Ice Cube and Cuba Gooden Jr. and Lawrence Fishburne and they're... You know, and they're just these young men who are trying to just, you know, um, be the best they can be. Even though someone like Ice Cube is a guy who's just come out of prison, you know, he's like, I'm not going back to prison. I'm going to try to be better. And, And the great tragedy of these two brothers, you know, one who is, um, you know, try, you know, is this sports a uh, driven guy who 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 is about to be chosen for for college scholarship who who's going to go to college and even is considering before that going to the army and the one thing he the struggle he has that he has a child and obviously the sort of pressures he's under and then you have Ice Cube who is his brother who is unfortunately treated like the lesser brother because he's been to prison because his prospects are lesser because he's running with guys who are almost on the cusp of being a gang He's seen as already a failure, even though, again, he is trying his hardest to not be what people expect of him. But there's a certain, as I've talked about extensively, the nature of tragedy and the fact that are these things inevitable? They are because they're a narrative, but are they, you know, the structure of the story, was it, was there any hope for these characters had things not gone the way that they had and when the great tragedy moment occurs you just get this sense of fruitlessness where the great you know the 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 reason that a character who dies dies is simply because it is just 
happenstance almost and it's heartbreaking because it shouldn't have gone the way it did and of course the great tragedy that spirals from that and how it almost consumes everyone in its wake and destroys so much it's heartbreaking because you just get that sense of there was real hope and of course the narrative is built around the idea of giving so many characters hope and yet taking it away and as I say Ice Cube I mean, Ice Cube, this was the point where he, he was on the cusp of so many different things. But here he is such a good actor. He plays so much with so little. You know, he doesn't speak a lot. But there's so much performance in his face. And hey, he went on to be an incredible musician for many decades and then went back to acting. But the part, as I was watching him there, I honestly watched him and went, oh, if he'd have stayed in acting, you know, we could have had decades of this incredible actor things didn't go that way he, he very much went in a different you know he chose to follow music sort of for, for many many decades or several decades but he is excellent here he really is you know he, he is definitely the probably the standout character and there's the moment towards the end of the film where he is stood and the camera's panning up and you can't tell by the way the camera's framed if it's supposed to be a moment of strength or a moment of of, of trap of weakness and, and great loss and oh, this is an excellent film as I say the way it's played out is slice of life you don't know where this is going there are moments in it we think oh well, this is this you know this could escalate or these characters there's friction between them but it feels like every day just is just going through until you get to the climax and the climax almost comes out of nowhere and it makes everything that's come before it truly heartbreaking Poison Hood is an excellent film. It is, it is, you know, seminal. It is absolutely, um, and in terms of representation of, of African American performers and the community, I can see why this is held up because, you know, it represents the sort of everyday struggle. It's not supposed to be a great dramatic story about gangsters or a dramatic story about, you know, it's supposed to represent the idea of just every people are living their lives and trying to build a community and trying to get out from, you know, a, a, you know, a, a racist nation that, that doesn't help them build anything. And, and yeah, it's an excellent film, excellent film. Um, well, you know, easily the time just flies by watching it as well. Anyway, thank you for joining me. If you like this video, hit the like button, comment below, and share the video, because that's all helped me in the algorithm. Subscribe to the channel and hit the bell to get notifications of when new videos are uploaded. Check out my back catalogue of over 200 videos, and follow me on Twitter at Jordan underscore Woodley, where I tweet about TV shows and films, and I share these videos once they're uploaded to YouTube, either the day of or the day after. Thank you for joining me. Take care.